out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jack. I don't care if I never get back. Let me root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. Well, it's one, two, three strikes. You're out at the old ball game. Well, I am Jason, and welcome to a sports edition version of Historically Marked. I am outside um, Ballpark Village and Bush Stadium in downtown St. Louis. And it's Cardinal Nation to those who live here, the locals, those who love the St. Louis Cardinals. And as you can see, I'm wearing a uh, Cardinals jersey, and um, yes, I am a lifelong fan of the team. Thank you for your sympathy. <laughs> but in the background of me is Ballpark Village. They've definitely redeveloped the area which you know has been constantly changing over the last few years and right in front of me is Bush Stadium and I'll go ahead and give you a pan shot of that so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, give you a little historic tour because there is lots of historical stuff um, like markers sidewalk plaques on the ground so I'll be more than happy to lead the way All right, so I'm standing behind one of my favorite places to go in the summertime, and yeah, sometimes it's spring and fall time, you know, um, during the beginning of the season and postseason, respectively. But yes, I am standing behind Bush Stadium, and um, right now it's June 2020 as I'm doing this, and as most of you know, yes, the COVID-19 concerns have locked every sports fan out of their favorite stadiums, and even the ball players and the people who have worked at the stadium as well. So yes, I mean it's a lose lose for all people but i mean we're, i understand we're all doing it to keep everyone healthy and safe so yes i totally respect that but you know i mean it's also kind of you know a depressing way of looking at um some of the empty stands here but uh while i'm here you know i'm just going to check out some of the history that has been lined up outside the stadium so i will go ahead and show you and now we are approaching a jack buck memorial statue and so here is a Jack Buck shrine for you. And this has a marker on there. And um, normally during like ball games, you can hear his broadcast. They have like a loop, I believe, or a recording of his famous broadcast. And as of today, obviously there's no baseball games going on. So I guess they put on hold for now, but I'm gonna do a little close up of this nice statue here. Um, Mr. Buck, I know you're resting in peace and definitely look at the, pay close attention to those camo X. And I know it's collected dust. Somebody should be cleaning this, by the way. All right. <laughs> but here is the statue and the plaque. Hopefully you can read it. All right, so here's one that I find to be very interesting. Now, I'm standing next to one that has like ghost um, remnants of the old stadium from, you know, the one that was here till 2005, Bush Stadium. Um, two or is what it's generally called, but here's one that says this All right, so we're gonna take a look at that and oh Well, you know, I'm standing in it Whoopee. <laughs> And across from me of course is ballpark village and here is another one of those um, foul lines this one is from the right field from the previous Bush Stadium which happened or I'm sorry which was existent from 1966 to 2005 this is another sign and I'm gonna go ahead and stand it see how about that so I'm staying by home plate or gate 2 and please excuse the cars I am NOT too far from a freeway but um, this is where it starts chronologically so I'll go ahead and take you there to the first one.
So this inaugural one, this is celebrates their National League membership in 1892. They are now officially part of Major League Baseball or National League. Now, as many of you know, the Cardinals, their team color is red, but it wasn't always that way. In 1899, on April 15th of that year, Willie McHale, a writer for the St. Louis Republic, overheard a lady remark, what a lovely shade cardinal, and repeated this in this column, and by 1900, Cardinal Red was the team color, and it still is to this day. Now, I'm going to kind of go by some of these. Oh, here's one. This is a presidential visit. William Howard Tapp became the first sitting president to attend a baseball game in St. Louis. How about that? As he took in the first few innings of the Cardinals game at League Park. I'm, kind of, I'm going to kind of buzz by these a little bit. Here's another one that is about their logo and uniform. Birds on the bat. April 8th. 1922, St. Louisans received their first glimpse of the birds on the bat jersey in a preseason game against the Browns. The logo was inspired by table decorations designed by Allie Mae Schmidt for a men's lunch on in Ferguson, Missouri, attended by Cardinals GM Branch Rickey. Now, it wasn't until 1926 that the Cardinals won their first ever world championship. So here you go, here is the plaque that details it all. I'm going to skip ahead to 1934. Dizzy Dean shut out the Detroit Tigers 11 0 in game seven to bring home the team's third world championship. The game was decided when the Cardinals scored seven times in the third inning, highlighted by Frankie Frisch's three run double. Now, this one is a little bit historic. Uh, the Cardinals hosted their first night game versus the Brooklyn Dodgers under lights installed at Sportsman Park in St. Louis in 1940. And this is the part where Stan Musial comes in. September 23rd, 1941, Stan Musial, a late season call up, hit his first career home run off a of Pittsburgh Pirates pitcher, Rip Sewell. And now I am approaching the 1942 World Champions. I apologize for my shadow. But it says here the Cardinals beat the New York Yankees 4-2 in Game 5 to win their fourth World Championship. Ina Slaughter and Whitey Kurowski led the way with home runs. And catcher Walker Cooper picked a runner off second to stifle a Yankees rally in the bottom of the ninth. Here's a weird one that says Musial is amazing, even though that is necessarily true. <laughs> But on that date, October 3rd, 1943, Stan Musial won his first National League batting title with a .357 average and was named the National League's MVP for the 1943 season. During that season, however, um, the Cardinals went to the World Series again. They swept the Chicago Cubs at Sportsman's Park. So they claimed their second National League pennant in, in as many years. But they did, however, fall to the Yankees that year. But never fear, because in 1944, they would win the following year, as it says on this coming plaque right here. And this was the only World Series that was fought um, entirely in St. Louis, because the St. Louis Browns and the St. Louis Cardinals, the two home teams, fought together <laughs> in what is called as the Streetcar Series. And as the plaque says, it was the only pennant for the American League Browns and they um, later became the Baltimore Orioles after the 1953 season. Forty-six, the year after um, World War II ended, yes, we went back to the World Series and we eventually won. 
I know. And this is awesome. <laughs> Brett Shandies hit a home run in the 14th inning to give the National League a 4-3 win in the All-Star Game at Comiskey Park in Chicago in 1950. And Stan Musial, he hit home he had five home runs in one game. Or actually in the same day, I should say, but it was a double header. So yes, that should be taken <laughs> to consideration. But it was a, he set a major league record for home runs hit in a single day. So yes, that that day was May 2nd, 1954. And here's another one devoted to Musial. 3,000 hits. He collected his 3,000th hit off Chicago Cubs pitcher Mo Jabrowski with a pitch hit RBI double into the left field corner at Wrigley Field. And the funny story about it is Stan Musial intentionally wanted to do it at home. He didn't even want to play that day. He was in the dugout for most of the time, but he uh, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, they pretty much sweet talked him into uh, stepping up to the plates and yes, his dream didn't happen, but either way, 3,000 hits, yes, it did happen, <laughs> which was bound to anyway. And now we are approaching the end of the left side of Bush Stadium with um, Boyer's Grand Slam in 1964. With the Cardinals down by three runs in the sixth inning, Ken Boyer smashed a Grand Slam off New York Yankees pitcher Al Downing. The Cardinals went on to win and squared the World Series at two games each. I'm in the north end of the stadium, and and I'm going to continue on with those walkthrough history plaques in just a second. I still got some ways to go to get to the other side, so kind of bear with me on that one. <laughs> All right, so I'm at the northeast corner of Bush Stadium at Broadway and Clark, and I'm going to continue on with the chronological pieces of baseball's greatest moments, or actually the Cardinals' greatest moments, my bad. <laughs> so going to continue on into the 1960s. And in 1966 was when the old stadium opened, the old Bush Stadium as it's well known around here. But in 1966, the home plate was moved by helicopter from Sportsman's Field on North Grand to here, even though the stadium was a little bit of a distance from where I'm standing. That same year, in preparation of the new stadium, yes, the All-Star Game took place. And as you would see in a, later in this video, the All-Star Game came back to, into St. Louis in 2009. Their first world championship at Bush Stadium, at the old Bush Stadium that is, was in 1967. Bob Gibson was the star of that game. Now here is one that is uh, not really well known among baseball and Cardinal fans, but the first Grand Slam in Canada back when Montreal Expos was a team and back when they were brand new, Dal Maxville, who was a Cardinal, hit a Grand Slam home run against the Expos in the first ever Major League Baseball game in Canada. <laughs> I know, it's kind of weird how the Cardinals and history is linked, you know, with all of Major League Baseball. All right, now here is one with Lou Brock as the star. He collected his 104th and 105th stolen bases at Bush Memorial Stadium against the Phillies to tie and break Mari Wills' Major League Baseball's single season record that happened on September 10th, 1974. And this is where he really beat the record. He passed up Ty Cobb on August 29th, 1977. And that happened in San Diego, as it says right here. And the decade ends with Gary Templeton, whom we all know that uh, we traded for Ozzie Smith. <laughs> so, but this one is about him. He, um, batting right-handed switch hitter Gary Templeton recorded his 100th hit of the season and became the first major league player to collect 100 hits from each side of the plate in a single season. Wow.
Very interesting stuff. So I'm going to continue to move down here for a bit. And here we begin in 1982. Uh, yes, here's one of my favorites, Willie McGee, who we got that year just in time for the World Series. He capped off a sensational rookie season, hit two home runs, and made two catches that prevented Brewers homers in Game 3 of the World Series in Milwaukee. Manager Whitey Herzog later remarked, I don't know if anyone has ever played a better World Series than Willie. <laughs> that definitely sounds like Willie. I'm sorry, Whitey. And as many people know that year, that was our... Um, ninth world championship and of course that wouldn't be um matched until 19 i'm sorry 2006. here's one of jack buck's famous calls go crazy folks <laughs> and that year um the cardinals made it to the world series again but that year we fell to the kansas city royals but it was still a memorable one Now, those, a lot of you will probably remember this one where uh, Tom Herr hit a 10th inning walk-off Grand Slam, which was the first of his career. And that same night, um, when fans were given seat cushions as um, attendance um, gifts, I guess, uh, the first, say, 500 maybe, well, they all ended up on the field. <laughs> I'd like to know how many actually took theirs home that night. And again in 1987, um, the Cardinals won the pennant um, going into the World Series. But, uh, of course, we lost that year to the Minnesota Twins. But, hey, you know, we still had our game high, and Whitey Ball was still a powerhouse. All right, now here's one from 1993 that I remember. Hard-hitting Witten. Mark Witten became the first Cardinal player to hit four home runs in one game. Witten also collected 12 runs batted in, which tied Jim Bottomley's franchise record, originally set in 1924. Now, whenever the Cubs come to town and vice versa, when the Cardinals fans, um, when the Cubs and Cardinals are playing in Chicago or here, yes, both Wrigley Field and Busch Stadium draw big crowds. But here is one that notes the largest crowd. 1998 was a memorable year, mostly because of the McGuire and Sosa home run chase. But I do remember when Mark McGuire started off that season with a grand slam. Oh man, that man was on fire. And of course I know the whole controversy behind it. So uh, no need to get into that. I suggest you draw your own conclusions, do your own research, that kind of thing. This is where he uh, topped off Roger Maris. And he did eventually break that uh, record, um, that home the home run year. And Sammy Sosa did hit 66 home runs. And McGuire finished off that season with 70, which was thought to be very unmatched. However, Barry Bonds um, broke that record about three or four years later. And like I said, it's very, very subject to controversy about uh, what happened. Now here is Fernando Tatis. Now this was one of the unbelievable records even today two grand slams in one inning from the same pitcher i mean can you believe that <laughs> now we're back to mark mcguire again this was where he hit 500 home runs at the time he was only the 16th player to be part of that club but there's been a few more that have been added over the years this was the first one post 9-11 when uh, sports was temporarily put on hold, and um, I remember the military and police and law enforcement, they were here at Bush Stadium. I was not there, but I remember watching it on TV, and Jack Buck gave a very moving speech that night. And like I said, in 2004, the birds were back in the World Series. However, uh, the Boston Red Sox was very motivated that year as well because it was their year they would break the so-called curse of the Bambino. They would reverse the curse, sweeping the Cardinals four to nothing. 
but we did held our we hold our we held our hands up high the fans and the players and that was of course until 2006 which is detailed here that's when we beat the tigers in the world series that would be our 10th championship of all time and again we hosted the all-star game And this is the last one of the whole Walk of Fame, uh, Cardinals' greatest moments. 